Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am really I'm the moderator of the webinar. My name is Admiral Dr. Singh. I am from the medical side, also managing director of Innovation Curious, which are two part for profit and not for profit. We have created a knowledge platform, and that knowledge platform is the one who does the conference. We have the magazine, which goes to 84,000 people through Amazon. We also have the knowledge webinar that one now being created. And uh, we have done for Government of India to Hackathon and Ideathon, which are uh, more than 11,000 people were the one which have joined in in that particular place. So, and the certain training yesterday, we talked about the cyber security in healthcare, where some uh, the Prime Minister's office at center who is in charge of the whole of the cyber in India. He was there and he was presiding. We are launching a course in July for the health sector itself. So we look for new initiatives which are there, which brought to India. They are also one of the things I can see the artificial intelligence. The new buzzwords we people talk, blockchain, artificial intelligence, etc. We are also starting a course for health sector in artificial intelligence in month of September. Work is going on. So we are really happy to be part of any initiative which can help the theme of India that make in India do bring some technologies which is from the emerging emerging uh, market what we have and people are interested which can have optimized the cost and yet it has the quality so these are the few of the initiatives we take certain delegation took it to sweden europe is very well known because in finland my uh, professor is very close to me. he has been co-author of my two books which were published in the us to cut the story short, this is what uh, we are. And I'm really happy today that the topic is something very great because the diabetes as such, we are also along with the people developing for common person awareness training program. I find that two of the people whom I know, Dr. Sheila John, who has a, a Shankar Netrale, she is the head of department of teleophthalmology. We have done quite some work has been done in Northeast on teleophthalmology because ophthalmologists are not so many. And as she was talking to me before webinar, that uh, telemedicine is the one which can also come to the rescue along with this. Uh, diabetes, we are supposed to be diabetic capital. So there are many things which are there which will take in into this by the Sheila John. Another is Fabian, who is expert in uh, imaging, and he has a camera. And ultimately, if we can add uh, artificial intelligence, we can see how specific in city and what kind of a diagnosis it can help. So it can uh, human intervention also because we don't have so many of the ophthalmologists, so can such human intervention technology can take on and benefit the thing. Uh, not taking much of your time, uh, I thought I've just given you a background that the whole idea of this webinar is to introduce some of the equipment which is in this direction, and Fabian will also uh, tell how it can be taken up and how artificial intelligence can be integrated while technical details of diabetic retinopathy with which uh, Sheila John will be doing. I uh, now invite uh, Dr. Sheila John for her deliberation on the subject. Uh, welcome Dr. Sheila John, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to thank you for uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, i've been i've been the head of teleophthalmology department in shankar netralaya and uh, doing telemedicine 
since 2009. Earlier, we were doing it with the Indian Space Organization. Then later, because we had to put the satellite on top of the bus, we shifted to broadband. And uh, we do camps in the nearby villages. So I'm very happy for the organizers to have given me this topic, solving diabetic retinopathy diagnosis through artificial intelligence. I work in Chankar Netrali Eye Hospital in Chennai. Healthcare availability in India. 80% of the population reside in rural areas. 70% of the healthcare resources are in urban areas. One ophthalmologist per 100,000 population. What is diabetic retinopathy? Diabetic retinopathy is a sight-threatening microvascular complication of diabetes. And diabetic retinopathy is the primary cause of preventive blindness in a population of more than 70 million diabetic patients. Now, if you see diabetic retinopathy in India, there's 72.96 million cases of diabetes in the Indian population. Prevalence of DR is 18 to 20% in the diabetic population. So what are we doing? We are trying to identify 5 to 6% of the site threatening diabetic retinopathy because that will cause loss of vision and it requires immediate treatment by the ophthalmologist. Now, lack of human graders to support the screening of DER because the number of people affected by diabetes and diabetic retinopathy are getting increased day by day. So what do we need? Preventive eye care through early identification of diabetic retinopathy to prevent blindness. Now, screening strategies for diabetic patients, for diabetic retinopathy camps, what do we do? We have involved the villages, nearby villages to do diabetic screening camps. We go into the general hospital, at the physician center, at the diabetologist center. Also, we enroll patients. Then we do door to door also, either whether it is rural or urban, we go household, every household in the village is enrolled. And then we contact the NGOs also to see they, whether they can identify the diabetic patients and bring them. Now, treatment challenges are an estimated one half of the diabetic population does not receive annual di dilated eye examination, does not receive or see the fundus of the diabetic patient. Urgent referral, side threatening diabetic retina for the patients is essential to prevent visual loss during their productive years of life. Late stage treatment of diabetic retinopathy is also enormously expensive. Teleophthalmology and artificial intelligence practices in India. The three models which we follow are mobile eye care services. The buses go to the rural areas or the households and in rural. Then we have fixed centers called vision centers. The other one is in the diabetic clinics. Teleconnectivity is through satellite, Indian Space Research Organization, broadband, national knowledge network, data card, and lease lines, and through mobile phones. Eye care on wheels, SNTOP. Connecting urban facilities to rural areas through these mobile vans with trained manpower and the state of art ophthalmic equipment. Teleconsultation using broadband connectivity. No dis designed patient examination room inside the bus. Now, workflow of the camp. The main thing is one week before you have to engage out of person and go throughout the village announcing as well as distributing pamphlets so that you get about 100 to 150 patients at the campsite. The one another thing is all patients are registered on the electronic medical records. They're done, not done on paper. Then auto refraction is done. After registration, subjective refraction is done, the circlamp examination is done, fundus examination is done, spectacles, certain spectacles are made at the site and given. You have the doctor or the nurse to examine the patient for the BP, pulse, and everything. Teleconsultations are being done. And for the waiting patients, what we do is explain about the various eye diseases. This is one EMR chart with all the demographic details and patient examination. 
Here you can see the ocular fundus images being uploaded into the fundus, into the EMR. This is a video which I would like to share. This is the mobile van going into the villages. You can see uh, auto refractor is there, subjective vision testing is there. Glass prescription is done, and then you can do the teleconsultation. You can see the optometrist sitting with the patient, and I'm interacting through the laptop thing. The patient has understood what teleconsultation is. She sees her photo, optometrist photo, as well as me, who's sitting at the base hospital. Now, the patients who require immediate treatment to be done are taken into the bus, as well as the cataract surgery patients are on the bus. Now, how do we use artificial intelligence in the camps? After taking the fundus pictures, the artificial intelligence is run over the fundus picture and it says presence or absence of diabetic retina. If it has been uh, done in such a way, it can even say non proliferative diabetic retinopathy and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It is useful to identify site threatening diabetic retinopathy because site threatening diabetic retinopathy, those people will lose vision. So, immediate treatment is required. Artificial intelligence, efficiency for identification of different grades of diabetic retinopathy. International clinical diabetic retinopathy disease severity scale. Automatic screening has effectively differentiated between the presence of diabetic retinopathy and absence of diabetic retinopathy. The automatic screening for diabetic retinopathy should identify vision threatening diabetic retinopathy so that those patients are referred to the base hospital for further investigations. What is the 2020 American Telemedicine Association ATA guidelines for diabetic retina? The system that identifies patients with none or very little non proliferative diabetic retina. The system that identifies patients with or without sight threatening retina. The third is the system that can identify the different stages of diabetic retina, non proliferative, proliferative, and macular retina. Fourth is the system that equals or exceeds the ability of the ETDRS photographs to identify DR issues. Twenty twenty American Telemedicine Association guidelines for AI. Autonomous AI in healthcare makes clinical decisions without human oversight. So the patient outcomes, reference standard, accountability, medical liability are primary concerns. So you have to First, elevate artificial intelligence, diagnostic accuracy, and system design. The AI software that operates as a medical device that follow the international medical device regulators forum and guidelines. So, what are the things false positive and false negative should be identified for the artificial intelligence? What are the cases which can give false positive? Causes are due to artifacts, poor image cap capability, misclassified hemorrhages, drusen, hyper, and hypopigmentation. False negatives are the absence of hard exudates or surrogate markers for diabetic retinopathy. We can miss the diagnosis of diabetic macular edema. Here, when you see the pigmentation is varied, it does not show the pigmentation of the normal fungus. In a myopic patient, you can see these pigmentation variations. Now, the algorithm, if it is not used to the pigment variation, this will report it as diabetic retina because it doesn't show the uniform glow which is seen in normal patients. Again, here the surrogate markers are the hard exudates which are seen in the macular area. When this is the case, the algorithm will report as diabetic macular edema. The macular edema is there without the hard exudates, the surrogate markers. It might not recognize the macular retina. It might need further investigation. Now, IDX DR20 device has been approved by FDA in US. And this has been used as a DR algorithm in 2018 to detect diabetic retinopathy during clinical flow in patients. IDX was developed by Amrock et al. 
and has a sensitivity of 87% and 90% respectively. So it has a good efficiency of retinal image grading for automated grading in clinical practice. And they are trying to use it in primary care to decrease the demand on optometrists. Now, Aditya Jodh Eye Hospital and Aditya Jodh Foundation for Twinkling Little Eyes, Bombay, Professor Dr. Nadrajan, has implemented an offline automated AI analysis system in detecting referable diabetic retinopathy on retinal images taken with the smartphone. This was based on a portable non mediatic retinal imaging system, which can be done by a health worker. The application of artificial intelligence augments the screening for referral diabetic retinopathy in remote areas where services of the internet is not there as well as the ophthalmologist. He is trying to do a nationwide diabetic retinopathy screening drive to prevent blindness due to DR. And Professor Dr. S. Nandrajan has done a lot of work for diabetic retinopathy as well as artificial intelligence. The other landmark study was Google study deep learning, prospectively validated the performance of automated DR system in India. Study conducted more than 3,000 diabetic patients at Shankarnetralia and Aravindai Hospital. The automated DR system compared with manual grading by one trained grader and one retina specialist on each side. Referable DR, the automated DR system's performance equal to or exceeded manual grading the sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 95%. Now, what are the legal questions for the artificial intelligence? How can, when any patient comes to the hospital, you ensure consent from the patient, saying that we are going to do such a test, we are going to do such a surgery, and patient and the attender give the consent. So, when you are using artificial intelligence for medical conditions, you have to take the consent from the patient. So, how do AI system ensure consent. How will questions of liability be addressed? But the artificial intelligence, when it is doing, is the software going to take up the thing or the doctor who supervises the artificial intelligence and validated is going to take the liability? And how does AI fit into existing ethical framework, frameworks in India? See, medical fraternity have an ethics that certain tests can be done on humans and certain tests which you're going to try has to be done only in animals. So certain ethical framework has been given to medical people. Now, how is the artificial intelligence, when it is coming into the medical field, how it is going to fit into this ethical framework? It's a question. Then who's account accountable for the errors? Is the software or the doctor who validated it or the engineers who are concerned in bringing the hardware? That accountability has to come because diabetic retinopathy especially sight rending lateral diabetic, if it is not treated, the patient will lose vision. So you're going to make a blind person if it is not recognized. So the accountability is very, very important here. Now, how can the security and accuracy of AI solutions be ensured in the health sector as individual lives will be at stake and highly sensitive data is being handled? This again has to be addressed. Now, Government of India has brought in the Telemedicine Practice Guidelines 25th March 2020. Amendment in the Indian Medical Council, Professional Conduct and Ethics and Ethics, and Ethics Regulation 2002 by Medical Council of India, enabling registered medical practitioners to provide health care using telemedicine. This is very important. Till now, the government had not taken any legal thing to protect the person. Practitioners to provide healthcare using telemedicine. Eye care in remote areas. India is currently is a country with diverse cultural heritage, geographical location, remote and tribal areas, plays a critical role in de delaying the diagnosis and diseases causing blindness. So you should have a mobile teleophthalmology screening camp using AI, identifies DR and prevents visual loss. Now cost effective. The automated computerized screening system further reduces the workload for human graders, both ophthalmologists and trained graders. Additionally, the process is considerably cost effective in rural areas and in less developed countries compared to manual. 
automatic DR screening reduces the cost for repetitive screening. Now, Vision 2020, the paramedical staff to leverage AI screening to identify and eliminate 80 to 82 percent of diabetic patients without DR, and to identify 18 to 20 percent of diabetic patients with DR, which can be sent in to the ophthalmologist for further treatment, and thereby you decrease the incidence of adult blindness in diabetic patients. Incorporation of the algorithm for routine screening of diabetic patients, large population studies at national scale will enable the wider deployment and empower minimally skilled technicians to participate in eye care delivery process. This can be done at a national level. Now, future studies, use of AI should not be only for diabetic retinopathy. It should be for other diseases because when you're seeing a diabetic retinopathy patient, the patient might not have diabetic retinopathy, but will have other diseases. So that also has to be identified and referred to the ophthalmologist. The validation of the performance of automated screening for classifying sight threatening diabetic retinopathy should be required in real world screening because these patients have to be identified and sent to the ophthalmologist to prevent visual loss and prevent blindness. I would always quote Professor Vikram Sarabhai, who is the father of the Indian space program. We must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies, the real problems of the society. Again, I would thank the Indian Space Organization who implemented telemedicine and teleophthalmology way back in 2003. So they got some specialist care to the various villages in India. They tried to implement in very remote areas so that patient got some very good specialist care. So it is due to Indian Space Organization that telemedicine has developed in India. Again, I, uh, this is my organization, Shankar Nekuralaya, where I'm working as head of the teleophthalmology. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Dr. Sheila. Thank you very much for the, the, the illustrations. Uh, I would uh, thank you for the what are the cause and this something through technology you have brought the patient and doctor near each other yet keep a social distancing. So that is one very good thing. However, the role of doctor cannot be really wishy washy. That will still remain. I I am thankful to all the people who have joined this webinar. And there are professionals who have registered more than 100, and I can see quite a few of these people. It's very difficult to collect so many, so that shows the kind of interest. Now I turn myself to Fabian, who is from uh, I Care. He will talk the technology. He will talk as a, he has an experience of his uh, fundus camp, how it can take, and how it can assist uh, Dr. Sheila John, whatever problems have been created how artificial intelligence can be integrated and how it can be that patient sitting somewhere and doctor somewhere can we help each other, which reduces the cost. In India, cost is a big issue because every person cannot afford ophthalmologists and all the patient come to hospitals. So over to Fabian to learn from him on the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good evening to everyone. And I wish to thank the presentation from Dr. Sheila John. Especially I found interesting the question has about accountability of the AI because uh, working in the industry and working, having to talk with the engineers and having to talk with the doctors, this is a very challenging question that we are asking ourselves, what does a computer has the responsibility and where the responsibility finishes? Okay, however, I'm here to talk about uh, how do we take the best image of the retina. So I want to go through uh, the challenges that there are uh, to take a good image because if we want to take it, if we want to do diabetic retinopathy screening, uh, this we have to take a good image and then we have to give it to the AI and as best as the AI can be uh, also we need to have an excellent image that we have to give 
And we know this very well because of our experience that we have already with AI software in our phones many times. So the systems that take uh, uh, images of the retina, there are many types and some they have uh, very cheap or they are portable. There are systems that are handheld or there are manual systems and the image that they give, they can, they, it may be like the one on the top that you see here. And the image that you see on the top here clearly is an image that for a computer will be very different, very difficult to identify any feature compared to a very clear image of the retina, like the one we see here at the bottom. What are the challenges that uh, we, need, we face when we need to take a good photo of the retina? The biggest challenge by far is the issue of the size of the pupil. So uh, the pupil becomes smaller and if the pupil is too small, we cannot take a good photo of the retina. That's the, usually the systems, the cameras that are on the market with standard technology required to have a 3.5 millimeter size. And pupil dilation, there are pupil dilation drops, but uh, it's not easy to use them in screening camps. Usually these are used in hospital environments and will take also time. And it's a fact that more uh, population, uh, genetically a population that is under a very sunny um, and with much light, environment will have also smaller pupil. And then we have to take a photo of two eyes. So when we take the photo of the first eye, and then the pupil automatically will shrink before three millimeters. So this is um, one of the challenge that we as makers of camera, we try to face and to find solutions. And the second uh, huge challenge that we have when we have to screen a large population is the cataract. So patients over 60, and I've made a, I've made a check, and 50% of population over 60 has a, some form of cataract in India. When you have a cataract on the, you know, in the front of the eye, that makes it very, very difficult to have a good image of the back of the eye. And this is something that we need. We, have a, we need a good image of the back of the eye. So these are the two major issues that we find uh, based on the type of um, eye that we have in front of us. And then we have the challenges of the actual taking the exam. So to take a, a photo of the retina, that takes even more than three minutes to take two eyes on a manual system. And if we have a large quantity of patients and a large, a large population, the, the flow is important. And especially at these times, at these recent times, it's a very, uh, it's a very common talk to discuss about how can we minimize the patient exposure, because we cannot stay too close to the patient for too long time. So uh, this is one of the uh, technical issues that we try to solve. And manual systems, uh, like the handheld ones, the ones that you hold in your hand, and also the desktop ones, require good operator and operator with good skills. And this needs training. And we would like to see if we can avoid this. You know? Handheld cameras, they will require even more. So what happens is I, I found out four, is four major uh, points. That is the small pupil, the cataract, the time of the exam, and the necessity to have a skilled operator. If these are not met, uh, we can have lower quality images. And if we have lower quality images, the AI will generate more false positives. And if we have more false positives, we will, we will have a congestion of false positives on one side and even lower diabetic retinopathy detection. So how can we solve this at the source? So what we are working is, uh, at a system, a camera, that can try to fix these problems. And we launched, just before COVID, 
we launched a new camera that I want to introduce to you. And it's this camera called DRS Plus. And this is a system that has a new technology and try to address these issues. And unfortunately, the launch was in January 2020. And then we went to a Congress and to a couple of Congress, and then we cannot show it anymore so easily. Uh, but it's the latest technology and we are continuing to talk about. It. And we actually had time to use it in India, as you will see. This camera has very uh, important features. It can take photo with 2.5 millimeter size. So uh, address the, the, bigger, the bigger issue is that we need to have a small pupil and we can take photo with small pupil here. And then it's super fast. It takes two high eyes in less than 40 seconds. And it's fully automatic. It doesn't require any operator skill. It uses a special technology called true color confocal, which is this technology that allows us to do all the things about that takes so fast and so crispy images in 2.5. So when we mean when we say fully automatic, and this is very important, we really mean fully automatic. This is a system operated by a tablet, and basically you have here a screenshot of what you see on the tablet. And what you see is that you just need to press a button and then it will automatically do everything. It will find the eye, focus on the retina and shoot the two eyes, left eye, right eye. And everyone can use it. So we try to lower the bar and to lower the barrier to take excellent photos. I had time just before uh, the uh, lockdown to show it in Singapore in January 2020, and I made a 60 seconds video that I want to show you that how is this so fast. I'll try to play the video from here. Okay, I press this. Okay, one photo already done. One photo. And now we move to the other eye. Second eye. What did I say? Did I say 40 seconds? Sorry, this is 25 seconds. 25 seconds. 2.5 is the minimum super high resolution. Wow. So, so my screen. Yes. Hello. So I show you the video of that I did myself and we were enjoying to market this product that is launched in Singapore in January. And it was so amazing to see it do the photos in less than 30 seconds. So if you're not used to see how Fundus camera works, you may not be surprised. If you have experience on Fundus camera, uh, uh, you will uh, actually be shocked by how fast and easy it can take two images. And it takes an image with the quality that you see in this slide right now because of this true color confocal technology. As I said, it has an incredible sharp images and this is so much important when you try to give them to an AI system. And it works with small pupil. Small pupil means that do you, it means that you have a serious advantage compared to the other systems. Look at the image on the right, and this uh, this image on the right is taken uh, with a traditional camera, 
and it has a 3.2 millimeter pupil size, and the image is barely readable. Instead of the pupils on the DRS plus, the one on the left, you can go down to 2.9 millimeter size, and you have a still excellent photo, totally readable here. And this is very, very important feature that we can have. This is a case of a photo taken through cataract. So this true color uh, cofocal technology is, is so important because we can have excellent photos also uh, in case of cataract. And that's the second point that we need to address. Normal fundus camera cannot take very good photos, but this confocal technology is, uh, a, is a, like a scanning system. So it's, it's a scanning system that has an advanced uh, optical design that basically focus behind the retina, the, the, the pupil, and focus directly on the retina. And uh, if there is something in front like a cataract, I can see through. Let's see a case of diabetic retinopathy. This is the same patient, same eye, same day. And uh, on the right, you see what you get with the standard fundus camera. On the left, you see uh, what you get with the DRS plus. So the resolution of the image is totally different and allows you to see much more details. We've been we've been testing this system in uh, um, Arabian Eye Hospital in Pondicherry uh, in February. There was the last time we were able to use the DRS Plus myself. I was there in Pondicherry and we tested on a large flow of patients and we tested with hundreds of patients and it was exceptional to see it uh, operating. So we really believe this is a breakthrough technology that can allow you to, allows us to screen a large quantity of patients very easily and with no problem. The operator didn't have any training at all. I mean, three minutes training. Here you turn on and here you press the button and then you take the photos. And it was amazing to see it go. And the last time was 13, 16 February. There was the uh, All India Ophthalmology Congress in Gurugram. And I was there. And this is uh, the, the time we were able to show it at the Congress. So we, we were surprised to see how much interest there was for this camera. And that we were really, uh, was really exciting times. Exciting time here that uh, now we try to bring online about this new device. The system is a 2020 computer system. I mean, it has everything you expect from uh, a CAM a system from these times. It has a touch screen. It, you can play with the touch screen to magnify the system and apply filters. It has a browser-based viewer that allows you to review the image remotely from a, from a network computer. And basically, every kind of connectivity technology is present because we are in 2020 now, so it's, everything is there. And basically, we are ready to connect to all the AI systems in a different uh, technologies and also send the images to the internet for the teleophthalmology. And uh, this is also exciting times. We are um, in conversation with the AI companies and we are open, but basically we know already that this is in, uh, possible to integrate on any system because of the quality of the image we deliver is so superior uh, that uh, it's, it's a no brainer. And last but not least, it's only 11 kg. It's um, ideal for, uh, to take around with you. It can also go into a, with a carry case. You can take it around and uh, you can collect the photos online and then send online and offline and then send online later. So uh, it's, it's really, we cannot really call it portable because that's a category more to consider to the handheld, but you can actually take it around and plug it and play. And doesn't require any other computer. You just put it there on the table and take photos. 
then you go back to the hospital and you can do all the reviews. I didn't spend much time to talk about the company and I just go, I'll just give you one minute here about so our company is uh, Centerview Italy is makers of uh, imaging products and fundus cameras since 12 years automatic uh, new technology fundus cameras and uh, I announce you that now we are merging with iCare Finland company from uh, Vanta Finland that is the famous company that is a maker of uh, portable rebound autonometers. So now we are one company, I care center view, and we have all the new technology equipment that will uh, allow us to become a global leader in retina and glaucoma diagnostics. So I just take one minute to briefly remind you and tell you about the I care autonometer range. So these are portable tonometers that use a disposable probe. So um, compared to other tonometers to measure the pressure of the eye, um, you don't have issues of, um, of, uh, of uh, patient contamination because you have a probe that you, can, uh, uh, that you change from patient to patient. And this is very important at these times. And uh, this has been already academically uh, proposed. And we have a range of products that go from the entry level TA01 to up to the IC200, which also allow to take uh, the measurement of the eye pressure in supine position and on uh, patients on wheelchair. And even a, a eye care home that will allow the patient to take the measurement of the eye pressure by himself. And the technology that you use, use a probe that touch the cornea very, very gently. So this is the, the patent of the rebound, the technology of eye care. And we don't need any anesthetic drops uh, compared to other devices on similar on the market. And the whole procedure is super fast. It takes six measurements and then makes the average. And the, and the measurement is widely uh, demonstrated to be totally uh, the same as the gold standard. So uh, thank you so much for to be here to uh, be listening up to this time. This is our team and it's us and my team and the people in India that we work together. And if you have any inquiries about the uh, DRS Fundus camera and the DRS Plus and about the tonometers, please contact the guy in the arrow. This is our uh, uh, representative in uh, India, Mr. Badri, and he can answer to any inquiry you are curious about the product. Thank you, Mr. Fabian, and I think it's wonderful what you have spoken. <clears throat> there, are, there are many, many questions. Now there's a time for the question and answers. I don't mm -hmm. think we will be able to take all the questions. I'll tell Alok to take the important ones, and the balance will not go waste. We flash your email or maybe our email, and uh, we will pass on to the question. There are few to Dr. Sheila I Jones. Yeah, yeah, I like to ask you know, an important question because I've been in community work for a long. You know, yeah, almost yes. more than two decades I've been in community work. The first thing I look for in any equipment is electricity shortage is there in more in India, especially when you go into the rural side. Some days you get current in a building, some days you don't get current. So the first thing when I look for an equipment is, I do look whether there's a battery which can be charged and taken. I do take a generator. It is not that I don't take a generator. I do take, take a generator. But for me to collect all the equipment onto one generator becomes difficulty there. Because I have to have light, one thing, and fan for all my people who are working there. They are not going to uh, work without the fan. And second, I have to connect all the equipment. So some of the equipment like ophthalmoscope, retinoscope and all, if I have a battery which can be charged and can be used for six hours or seven hours, I try to use it. Then computers, I try to use UPS and other things. So that's one important thing. When I second, in a camp, to create a dark room is very difficult. So uh, what we have to do is, as he said, no, between three and 2.5, the fundus camera has to take the thing. Training of the fundus uh, person is no problem at all. 
so this, if any of the people can address the electricity shortage it will be good we do have a generator and we can definitely use it with the generator but the number of hours will be restricted because uh, when we have uh, so many equipment please be a little short please be a little short because there are so many questions yes, i'd like to give yeah, you know, I, I can try to answer this rapidly this yeah. is a very fabian, there is one thing fabian before yeah. you start the answer 80% of the question is what is the cost of the device and then of course dr sheila john has said so and then the other things which alok will take in a specified time whatever we can't take on i will pass it on to you yeah carry on thank you thank you for the questions uh, so the, yeah so please. fabian there is this question from uh, one person he is asking what is the light source of the camera laser or led and also yes. the cost okay. of cost 30 percent people asking yes. what is the cost of the device okay so i took some notes and um i'm going fact thank you for the questions and as an answer to this now the one about the battery is very interesting and it can be your battery operated or not uh, so at this right moment the system works uh, with an external power supply so it works like at a low voltage but requires a power supply so it's like let's say it's like using a laptop that you have the external power supply so we you act you do need a generator or an ups at this time maybe a, a ups could be sufficient because it's not high um watts that is going to use in fact this is more like a desktop system and now we realize how portable it is yes so um, it's very it's a very interesting point that uh, we we are considering the system itself is low voltage and there is an external power supply that is provided to provide the volts the and then there was a question about the dark room also and uh, so this uh, i forgot to say it but because we have the small pupil and this uh, technology that we use is uh, the dark room is absolutely not required the system can take photos even under light conditions so there is absolutely no need of dark room and that because of the technology so when they ask me about what is the technology if it is a laser or led so confocal technology usually is a laser technology that is available on uh, more uh, uh, i would say very expensive devices that stay in the hospital and we use led technology and led technology recently can provide the same uh, power as laser and that's why with led we can have a white light and that's why we can have true color so it's led based with a technology that in the optical system is uh, similar to the laser based the cost of the device so what i can say you uh, for inquiries you should uh, please contact the mr badri that uh, maybe we can share the email uh, if we're going to do it but i can tell you that the cost of the device is comparable to the uh, price of the cameras the japanese fundus cameras that are in that similar price range so there are uh, japanese fundus cameras uh, that makes the standard photos and semi automatic from those cameras and we are in the same price range as these cameras so uh we should uh, we should get more into detail there okay uh, we have one question for dr sheena uh, is your institution using any such technology what is your opinion about it what technology sir and this ai technology are is your institution using any ai technology yeah we have uh, combined with iit chennai and developed one artificial intelligence which we are using in the camps and we have also worked with google our hospital was one of the hospitals which worked with google and that was done at the base hospital there were okay. several hospitals who worked with google to develop an artificial intelligence thing or for dr we help them to okay. work it but that will be used i think in real field trials okay ma'am uh, fabian this question is for you 
what would be a near future trend towards online AI or offline AI? Offline AI would be the best because without internet connectivity, you can still use it. No? The one developed by IIT Chennai was an offline AI, which I'm using. And there's one person called, I already told you, Dr. Nadrajan. He is from Bombay and Aditya Jyothai Hospital. He has also used an offline AI and given good results. Uh, I agree. I agree to uh, offline AI is the optimal and the technically may be possible and it's starting to become possible. Um, many big American companies are a little bit against the offline AI concept because they want online because it's possible to uh, build a pair image. Offline will be a little bit more difficult. But I, I think the trend is changing and we're getting into offline, in my opinion. Okay, continuing to it, uh, uh, one question is which AI system is the device compatible with? So the device has been launched in January. So we are at the very beginning. It's a new technology product. So right now we are collecting images and we are uh, we are talking actually with multiple companies and we are trying to make our device compatible with any AI. Uh, that we can have. So I cannot at this ex exact moment recommend one specific uh, AI to be compatible. I can say that stay stay tuned and look at also the technologies that are available in India, which are multiple, and we are really looking forward to be compatible with them. The, ma the machine is there, but of course it's been launched uh, for six, five months ago and two months later, we had to slow down our uh, work here, uh, but uh, we're very excited to see where we're getting. Okay, uh, one more question is, it's more kind of common question, especially in COVID times, how do you recommend to clean the machine and how long does it take? We have a specific uh, procedure for that. There is a procedure uh, that we've been using uh, that actually it was present even before, but we just uh, rechecked and made sure, and we have a procedure using uh, alcohol wipes and how do you, 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 you clean between uh, um, one patient to the other. So there is a procedure that we are providing and uh, it's actually quite easy and take a couple of minutes. Uh, there is a plastic rubber um, part that the patient touch and then basically this plastic rubber you can wash it either in alcohol or even in water with soap if you really want to to, to go that way or uh, it's even uh, replaceable okay uh, dr sheila this question is for you how does ai fit into existing ethical frameworks in, in india this is what I'm saying. Uh, for medical people, we have the Medical Council of India, which has laid on the ethical principles as well as our medical fraternity is there. Now for AI, there is no telemedicine government has given a legal framework. But for AI, there is no legal framework which is available. In uh, As far as the US is concerned, they have given uh, IDX thing with Michael Lambda that has been given the FDA clearance. But that is based on the machine. It comes with the fundus camera and uh, the AI is incorporated with it. So it has been given the medical device license with the approval. The only thing is, the, as far as the liability concerns, who's going to take the liability? When I see a patient and I miss a finding, the doctor is liable. Because here, the patient becomes blind. Right? Diabetic retinopathy, advanced stages, if you miss the diagnosis, the patient will lead go to blindness. So who is going to take the liability has not been decided. Okay, ma'am. Uh, we'll take one last question due to scarcity of time. Uh, Fabian, this is for you. Uh, is the hardware coupled with the deep learning? I mean, will this it say whether the patient has a disease or what grade of diabetic retinopathy? That is what, uh, what we want to do using an uh, uh, external system. So the system, we provide the best quality image, and that's where we are now. And that's what we know that we can do best. And uh, 
systems, deep learning and AI systems that can make the interpretation of this image is something that we, we, we are compatible with external systems. Okay, so uh, just one small question also we can take. What is the dioptric power of lens used in the DRS? Uh, this means what is the capability to uh, the range of autofocusing of the system, I guess. So that's uh, minus 15 plus 15 or minus 12 plus 15. I have to check. But yeah, it's, I think it's uh, minus 15 plus 15. It means that it will automatically compensate uh, the, the, the diopter correction. And the system, uh, I want to say, because of this technology, can work even if the patient has spectacles, has glasses on. So in case of extreme diopters, you can actually take the photo with the glasses. It doesn't, it doesn't look, it doesn't flash back like a standard from this camera that will be like taking the photo from here. Okay, thank you for, for the answers. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, you can take over. Okay, thank you very much. I am grateful for Dr. Sheila Joan for uh, her so much of time being an active ophthalmologist. I can understand the value of her time. We are grateful that you gave us all that. And this is a rare combination we wanted to try. What is the clinical ophthalmologist and what is the industry can fulfill each other? So Fabian was the second part that how new technologies can be brought in and people can try for it. I'm grateful to Fabian for all this. All the participants, we are really grateful and uh, don't worry because I myself have got around 24 odd questions, uh, but could not be answered. So you can, even you can write a mail to the Parthvi, who has been coordinator, logistic coordinator of this webinar. I am thankful to Alok for technical assistance and also for the logistic and uh, collecting the questions and answers, etc. And my other team member, Parthvi, who has taken trouble to launch this and take it. She will still be available to take on your questions and pass it on to these two uh, personalities. And may I request when we send the question, we'll also attach all the person from where it has come and if you can respond to them. Thank you very much. Hope we see each other more often, more nearer, only not by social distancing. Thank you very much. Grateful to you. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And it was very Thank good you. to participate.